Good evening and welcome to our Memorial Day program. We are gathered here tonight to honor those who have died in service to their country. We are to remember their achievements, their courage, and their dedication, and to say thank you for their sacrifices. Thinking of those heroes who join us in this group tonight and those who are here only in spirit, a person cannot help but feel awed by the enormity of what we encounter. We stand in the midst, midst of patriots and the family and friends of those who have nobly served. Millions of Americans have fought and died on battlefields here and abroad to defend our freedom and way of life. Today, our troops continue to make the ultimate sacrifices, and even as we lose troops, more Americans step forward to say, I am ready to serve. They follow in the footsteps of generations of fine Americans. Out of respect for the solemnity of this occasion and in memory of these lives that were lost, we ask that you please refrain from applauding at any time during the program. We also ask that all cell phones and pagers be turned off. Please rise for the processional, the posting of the colors, and please remain standing during the national anthem. members of the Eveleth and Gilbert Veterans Organization, band and choir members, parents, family, and friends, community members, and guests. On behalf of the Deuce Most Chapter of the Eveleth Gilbert Senior High Minnesota Honor Society, I would like to welcome you to this very special tribute for Memorial Day, a sacred day to all war veterans. The 
following are John Shepherd Shepler's words from a positive light. Memorial Day, perhaps more than any other holiday, was born of human necessity. Deep inside all of us is a fundamental desire to make sense of life and our place in it and the world. What we have been given, what we will do with it, and what will we will pass on to the next generation is all part of an unfolding history, a continuum that links one soul to another. In its early years, Memorial Day was known as, the de as Decoration Day, when graves were decorated with flowers and garlands. Although there are many stories of how Memorial Day actually began, it is thought that May 30th was chosen as a date because it was the anniversary of the discharge of the last Union volunteer of the Civil War. As early as 1866, the patriotic dead of the Civil War were honored in Waterloo, New York. Memorial Day was officially proclaimed as May 5th, 1868 by General John Logan, National Commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, and as General Order number, number 11. It was first observed on May 30th, 1868, that flowers were placed on the graves of the Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. The South refused to acknowledge the day until after World War I, when the holiday changed from honoring just, who's, just those who had died following the Civil War to honoring all Americans who had died fighting in any war. Memorial Day was observed on May 30th, 1968, when Congress moved the holiday to the last Monday in May. Way back during the Napoleonic Wars, the poppy drew attention as the mysterious flower that bloomed over the graves of fallen soldiers. In the 20th century, the poppy again was widely noticed after soils in France and Belgium became rich in lime from rubble during the First World War. The little red flowers flourished around the graves of the war dead as they had 100 years earlier. In 1915, Ontario native John McRae, a doctor serving with the Canadian Forces Artillery, recorded this phenomenon of the red flowers in his famous poem, In Flanders Field. In 1915, inspired by this poem, Moina Michael replied with her own poem. We cherish too the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led. It seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies. She then conceived of an idea to wear red poppies on Memorial Day in honor of those who had died serving the nation during war. She was the first to wear one and sold poppies to her friends and co-workers with the money going to benefit servicemen in need. And so, the poppy came to represent the symbol of remembrance. We would like to thank the Eveleth and Gilbert Ladies Auxiliaries for providing us with poppies to share tonight. As they are distributed, I will read McRae's famous poem, In Flanders Field, that inspired Moyna Michael. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow. Between the crosses, row on row that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are dead, short days go. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields.
Memorial Day is not just a time for honoring those men and women who died serving in uniform during wartime to preserve the freedoms that we cherish today. It is also time to remember the hundreds of individuals that have been listed as prisoners of war and those designated as missing in action. For their loved ones, there is no peace, no final resting place. You may have noticed the small table over there, set in a place of honor. It is set for one. This table is our way of recognizing those who are missing from our midst. They are, uh, they are unable to be here with us, and so we remember them also. This table set for one is small. It symbolizes the frailty of one prisoner against his oppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intention to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose displayed in a vase reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep faith awaiting in their return. The red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is reminiscent of the red ribbons worn upon the label, the lapel and breast of the thousands who bear witness to their unyielding determination to demand to demand a proper accounting for our missing. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. There is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family tears as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us tonight. The chair, the chair is empty. They are not here. Remember, all of you who served with them and called them comrades, who depended on their might and aid and relied upon them, do not forsake them, pray for them and remember them. Heroes unaware. I first saw him on a park bench. I've seen him every day, sitting in a shady grove where my children come to play. Sometimes he feeds the birds and squirrels or whittles little toys. Sometimes he just sits and smiles at the laughing boys and girls. And I never paid him any mind till one day just this year, I noticed he wore a frown and on his cheek a tear. While I asked him why he seemed so down, he looked up, began to say, I lost half my friends 60 years ago today. He told me of the terror as he fought to reach dry land. By the time the beach head was secure, half his friends laid in the sand. That was just one long day he fought on four years more. And the 60 years from then to now have not dimmed his sights of war. He said they have reunions just to keep in touch and share. And for each comrade who is, has gone on, they leave an empty chair. Well, his bark... <clears throat> well, his park bench has been empty now, about six months or so. And if I've never took the time, then I would have ever known that sitting on that simple bench with breadcrumbs and little toys was a man who gave his all to guarantee my daily joys. So give thanks to all the men and women who are still here and have gone before and made the highest sacrifice in both peacetime and in war. Because they fought our freedom, paid their blood, sweat, and tears. They endured the heartache of those empty chairs for all those years. So please do not ignore them or speed by without a care because you never know when you might pass by a hero unaware. And now for The Voice of Democracy by Quinn Muich. Former First Lady Michelle Obama once said, you may not always have a comfortable life, and you will not always be able to solve all the world's problems all at once. But don't ever underestimate the impact you can have, because history has shown us that courage can be contagious, and hope can take on a life of its own. These powerful words from Mrs. Obama are inspiring. History has taught us that one doesn't need to be rich or powerful to change society for the better. There are three things that I hope for in the future. Eliminating the racial tension that continues to divide this nation, continuing technological innovation, and ensuring that anyone who wants a college education can afford and get one. History teaches us that each of these goals is possible. For example, in 1955, a black seamstress named Rosa Parks was arrested for civil disobedience when she refused to give up her seat in the front of a Montgomery, Alabama city bus to a white man, which led to the Alabama bus boycott. 
Many historians believe that this action by a humble seamstress was a pivotal movement in the civil rights movement. Also, in 1960, a group of four black college students at North Carolina A&T University walked into a department store in Greensboro and sat down at a lunch counter marked, Whites Only. When the students refused to leave and insisted on ordering lunch, they were, they were arrested. This event started a series of sit-ins throughout the South to protest segregation in places that were open to the public. Not just lunch counters, but also beaches, parks, bus terminals, and swimming pools. This action by those four college students at North Carolina A&T was the catalyst for the provision in the 1964 Civil Rights Act that mandated that places open to the public be desegregated. I also hope for continued growth and innovation in technology. Two ordinary Americans showed that one does not have to be rich or powerful to change technology for the better. Bill Gates and Paul Allen. In 1975, these two friends from high school with great intelligence in algorithms and writing computer programs started a small company in Seattle called Microsoft. Today, it is the largest computer software company in the world. Although Mr. Gates and Mr. Allen are both wealthy men today, they were not wealthy when they launched Microsoft. Because almost every personal computer in the country has some kind of Microsoft product or software on it, we often take this technology for granted. However, it is important to remember that these two high school friends had an idea. Their software company revolutionized the computer industry and in the process ushered us into the technology age. My final hope for the future is that anyone who wants a college education can afford and get one. Many high school graduates want to continue their education, but their families don't have the resources to send them. Thankfully, the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars helped sponsor legislation called the GI Bill, signed by President Roosevelt in 1944, that gave federal money to any active duty veteran who wanted to receive a college education. According to the Department of Veterans Affairs website, nearly $20 billion has been paid to veterans and educational benefits since 2009. This staggering number shows the impact that the GI Bill has in improving access to higher education. In conclusion, Rosa Parks and the students at North Carolina A&T likely did not think they were making history and advancing the cause of civil rights. Bill Gates and Paul Allen likely never envisioned that their startup in Seattle would one day become the world's largest computer software company. And the members of the American Legion and the veterans of foreign wars who lobbied for the passage of the GI Bill likely never realized the great impact it would have over the next 73 years. These examples illustrate how ordinary people can make history and change society for the better. Can my hopes for the future be achieved? American history teaches us that the answer is yes. Meaning of Memorial Day. Sacrifice is meaningless without remembrance. America's collective consciousness de demands that all citizens be aware of and recall on special occasions the deaths of their fellow countrymen during wartime. Far too often, the nation as a whole takes for granted the freedoms all Americans enjoy. These freedoms were paid for with the lives of others few of us actually knew. So that's why we remember all of them on one special day. By honoring the nation's war dead, we preserve their memory and thus their service and sacrifice for the United States of America. Our nation mourns the loss of all Americans who died defending their country throughout the world since 1775. Most Americans are familiar with the major wars, but few think of those killed in minor frays. No American death is too insignificant to remember, however. When that life was lost at the behest of society, in other words, the death of a sailor in the Gulf is every bit as important as one killed in the Pacific during World War II. These are men and women who have remained mostly anon anonymous except for the families who love them. They, all, they came from all walks of life and all regions of the country, but they all had one thing in common, the love and loyalty they felt for their country. Who were they? They were relatives, friends and neighbors, 
med melded together to perform a service for an entire society. They were the nation's defenders. I am the flag by Ruth Apperson Roos. I am the flag of the United States of America. I was born on June 14, 1777 in Philadelphia. There, the Continental Congress adopted my stars and stripes as a national flag. My 13 stripes alternating red and white with a union of 13 white stars in a field of blue represented a new constellation, a new nation dedicated to the personal and religious liberty of mankind. Today, 50 stars signal from my union, one for each of the 50 sovereign states, in the greatest constitutional republic the world has ever known. My colors symbolize the patriotic ideals and spiritual qualities of the citizens of my country. My red stripes proclaim the fearless courage and integrity of American men and boys and the self-sacrifice and devotion of American mothers and daughters. My white stripes stand for liberty and equality for all. My blue is the blue of heaven, loyalty, and faith. I represent these eternal principles, liberty, justice, and humanity. I embody American freedom, freedom of speech, religion, assembly, the press, and the sanctity of the home. I typify the indomitable spirit of determination brought to my land by Christopher Columbus and by all my forefathers, the pilgrims, Puritans, settlers at Jamestown and Plymouth. I am as old as my nation. I am a living symbol of my nation's law, the Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights. I voice Abraham Lincoln's philosophy, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I stand guard over my nation's school, the seedbed of good citizenship and true patriotism. I am displayed in every schoolroom throughout my nation. Every school f schoolyard has a flagpole for my display. Daily, thousands upon thousands of boys and girls pledge their allegiance to me and my country. I have my own law, Public Law 829, the Flag Code, which definitely states my correct use and display for all occasions and situations. I have my special day, Flag Day, June 14th. It's set aside to honor my birth. Americans, I am the sacred emblem of your country. I symbolize your birthright, your heritage of liberty purchased with blood and sorrow. I am your title deed of freedom, which is yours to enjoy and hold in trust for posterity. If you fail to keep this sacred, sacred trust inviolate, if I am nullified and destroyed, you and your children will become slaves to dictators and despots. Eternal vigilance is your price of freedom. As you see me silhouetted against the peaceful skies of my country, remind yourself that I am the flag of your country, that I stand for what you are, no more, no less. Guard me well, lest your freedom perish from the earth. Dedicate your lives to those principles for which I stand one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I was created in freedom. I made my first appearance in a battle for human liberty. God grant that I may spend eternity in my land of the free and the home of the brave, and that I shall ever be known as Old Glory, the flag of the United States of America. Freedom is not free. I watched the flag pass by one day. It fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it, and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so young, so tall, so proud. With hair cut square and eyes alert, he'd stand out in any crowd. I thought how many men like him had fallen through the years. How many died on foreign soil? How many mothers' tears? How many pilots' planes shot down? How many foxholes were soldiers' grave? No, freedom is not free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everyone was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill. I wondered just how many times that tap meant amen when a flag had draped a coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of all the children, of all the mothers and the wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about a graveyard at the bottom of the sea, of unmarked graves in Arlington. No, freedom is not free. 
Yes, the people of the United States of America are free, but freedom takes sacrifice, and it is the men and women of the armed forces who make that sacrifice for all of us. Many of them have paid with their lives in places like Valley Forge, the Alamo, Guadalcanal, and Vietnam. Many of these people who devote their time often go unnoticed. Before the band tribute to four of the branches of military, let us also recognize those of you here tonight who are or who have been members of other military units and protective services. Members of the National Guard, please stand. Members of law enforcement, police, sheriffs, state troopers, and anyone else who guards our safety, please stand. Firefighters, paramedics, first responders, and emergency medical technicians, please stand. During the playing of the Armed Forces Medley, if you were or are currently a member of the our Armed Forces, please stand when your song is played. And would you please have your family members stand with you? Members of the U.S. Army, please stand. Members of the U.S. Air Force, please stand. Navy members, please stand. Members of the U.S. Coast Guard, please stand. U.S. Marine Corps members, please stand.
a moment of remembrance. On May 3rd, 2000, the, the Office of Press Secretary for President William J. Clinton announced the White House program for a national moment of remembrance, asking that on each Memorial Day at 3 p.m. local time, that all Americans observe a moment of silence. So, in anticipation of Memorial Day on Monday, let us now honor our war heroes by bowing our heads and observing this tradition of respect. Thank you.